Hi, and welcome to Plain Legacy. One viewer on the channel recently commented that they didn't know that Ford made an airplane, and possibly many people were unaware, which is why Plain Legacy focuses on aircraft not commonly known. Did you know that another one of the big three automakers, General Motors, also produced an airplane? Actually, they were involved with more than one, but today we're talking about the Fisher P-75, manufactured by the Fisher Auto Body Division of General Motors. Unlike the Ford Trimotor, the P-75 never got beyond the experimental stage and did not go into production, despite considerable promotional efforts at the time. It was an effort by a company making military vehicles to also produce aircraft for the war effort in World War II. Similar to the Aerospace Line Super Guppy, the subject of another episode on Plane Legacy, the P-75 was constructed with parts from several other notable aircraft. The project was led by designer Don Berlin, designer of the P-40 Warhawk. The reason for using components of other aircraft was to simplify the design process and to speed up production. First, there was the landing gear of the Vought F4U Corsair, its wheels retracting straight back into the wing. Next, they added the robust tail assembly of the Douglas SBD, though the tail would have to be redesigned later in the program. At different stages, either the laminar flow wings of the P-51 or the straight wings of the P-40 made up the outer wing panels. Finally, designers mirrored the arrangement of the P-39 Aero Cobra and its successor, the P-63, placing the engine behind the cockpit. In this configuration, power was transferred through the extended shafts to drive the propellers. The only original concept in the P-75, it seems, were the six-bladed contra-rotating propellers. The first patent for a contra-rotating propeller was submitted by F.W. Lanchester in 1907, just four years after the Wright brothers first took to the air. Contra-rotating refers to two propellers, one behind the other, turning in opposite directions. Not to be confused with counter-rotating propellers when two separate power plants each have a propeller turning in a different direction, such as the P-38 Lightning. Reasons why a contra-rotating propeller would be considered get into some fairly technical aerodynamics. Basically put, however, airflow through spinning blades of a single propeller at low speeds causes air to circulate around the body of an aircraft. This rotational force acts on the vertical stabilizer, causing the aircraft to yaw to the left or the right depending on which direction the propeller blades spin. This is why pilots of many types of aircraft add rudder inputs during takeoff until enough forward airspeed is obtained. In a similar way, asymmetrical torque, quote, occurs because the descending blade experiences a higher angle of attack compared with the ascending blade, generating more thrust on the descending side and causing the aircraft to yaw in the opposite direction. Both of these yaw-inducing issues are canceled out by a contra-rotating propeller, because the rotational force is eliminated and the torque is countered. Ultimately, contra-rotating propeller designs improve operating efficiency, meaning they use less fuel and therefore have greater range, although the extra weight for the gears cancel out some of that benefit. Their more complicated design and higher noise output has made them less popular, though, in the United States. Historically, Great Britain adopted contra-rotating propellers on a few Spitfire and Seafire variants, and their vulnerable Avro Shackleton has used it along with other designs. The Soviet Union employed contra-rotating propellers on their turboprop bomber called the Tupolev Tu-95, codenamed Bear by NATO, and several other aircraft including the Antonov An-22. In the U.S., contra-rotating propellers are found mostly on experimental aircraft, such as the famous Northrop XB-35 Flying Wing. Since greater range can be achieved with contra-rotating propellers, and the Army Air Force was initially looking for a long-range interceptor, designers adopted them for the P-75. The result was a range of somewhere between 25 and 2,600 miles. For reference, a round trip from England to Berlin was on the order of 1,000 miles, meaning the P-75 would have, theoretically, been able to make two round trips from England to Berlin. The P-75 Eagle had a greater range than that of the P-38, P-47, and even the P-51 Mustang. 
On paper, the P-51 had about 1,600 mile range with drop tanks or about 1,000 miles range on internal fuel. The P-75 first flew on November 17, 1943. It was the media darling of the day with extensive promotion for this airplane cobbled together from several other designs. It was dubbed the Wonder Plane with its sleek, modernistic profile and swashbuckling propeller. It was powered by the Allison V3420-19, which was a 24-cylinder turbo supercharged double V liquid-cooled piston engine, the initial variant producing 2600 horsepower. It was actually two of the V1710 engines used on the P38, P39, and P40, but connected to a common crankcase. Weighing in at more than a ton, it had a 5.5-inch bore, a single overhead camshaft per six-cylinder block, two intake and two exhaust valves per cylinder, and a general electric turbocharger with intercooler and a single-speed, one-stage gear-driven supercharger. Two 15-foot long drive shafts connected the engine to a prop shaft and a gearbox in the nose. Top speed figures vary by source, but somewhere between 430 and 440 miles per hour is given, depending on whether you're talking about the XP-75 or the P-75A version. Its service ceiling was 36,400 feet, and it had an impressive 5,600 foot per minute initial climb rate. However, the complicated engine design experienced air-fuel mixture problems, reducing power and fuel efficiency. The P-75's armament consisted of a blistering 1050 caliber machine guns, six in the wings and four in the forward fuselage. Those four in the nose had to fire through two propellers spinning in opposite directions, requiring in what we can guess was a complicated interrupter system. The P-75 would have been able to carry two 500-pound bombs. So why didn't the P-75 become the envy of the world? Well, as often is the case, production delays plagued efforts getting a prototype into flight testing, which it did in September of 1944. But it proved unwieldy in the air with poor spin characteristics. It had flight control issues and lackluster engine performance. An upgraded Allison 3420-23 was adopted with increased power and fewer overheating problems, but just like the original engine, it required considerable maintenance. Modifications to the tail assembly and the change to a bubble canopy improved aerodynamics. All of this created more delays, though, and added a cost factor which created a strain on the program. Moreover, it looked like by the time the P-75 would be ready to enter service, the war might be over. Its role was also changing. The 1942 design request was for an interceptor. As flight testing began in 1944, the United States Army Air Force was looking now for a long-range escort fighter. In this role, it didn't offer much in the way of an advantage over existing fighters of the day. In the end, the Army Air Force decided it already had proven designs serving as escort fighters that possessed sufficient range, which was becoming less of a problem as the Allies got closer to the German and Japanese homelands. Only eight XP-75s and six P-75As were built when production ended abruptly on October 6, 1944. The aircraft in today's episode is one of the six P-75A Eagles, and it is located at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Impressively restored at their facility, there are a few details provided about the specific provenance of this aircraft. Given the small number produced and the disappointing outcome, it is somewhat surprising that even one example survives. Thank you for watching today's episode. Please click the like button and be sure to subscribe, making sure also that you select the all notifications so that you won't miss any future content. Please leave a comment about what you think about the P-75 and tell us what you think a fully developed production aircraft might have been like. Be sure to check out earlier episodes on this channel and share episodes with your aviation and history-minded friends. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time right here on Plane Legacy. Legacy.